It's, it's going to be basically a general discussion about Malcolm X and his impact on, on us as individuals, uh, as a people in this country, and how he's, what we think as it relates to how he impacted the rest of the world. Y'all all right with that? So I am Alfonso McGriff III, and my sister's going to introduce herself and get this conversation started, all right? Hi, my name is Summer Tate. I'm an educator here in Hartford. I'm also a poet um, and a lover of Malcolm X, El Haj, Malik Shabazz. Um, you know, he has impacted myself, my teaching, um, to really be able to show that there is an ability for change, great change within a human being. You know, a lot of the times we want to look at one single stage of Malcolm's life when there have been so many different stages um, to make the great man that we know. Um, and to be able to really look at more than just one part of who he was, you know, especially towards the end of his life, he had, you know, even elevated to a different stage of understanding. And I think it really shows us how much we're able to do, um, to be able to um, change in our own lives, and to become something different for ourselves and for the people around us. Okay, and uh, we also have Brother Martin Jackson Sr. who just joined us, my uncle. <laughs> and uh, um, again, Martin, what we're talking about is, um, the discussion, basic discussion is Malcolm X, how he affected us individually, what you think he has done as far as affecting us as a people, and how your opinion on how he has affected the, in, the entire world. So you can introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about you and let us know what you think about Malcolm. Okay. Thank you, that's you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Martin Jackson. I'm, uh, I'm a associate pastor uh, from Metropolitan AMD Zion Church in Hartford, Connecticut, um, with Pastor Dr. Terry L. Jones. I'm also a doctoral student at Trinity Theological Seminary in, in Indiana, studying uh, mental health addiction and how it impacts our society through addiction. Um, came up through, through a period of time in the 60s under the Nation of Islam. Um, became a part of the Nation of Islam at a time when following that first wave. And so Malcolm, I believe, just as many other of our leaders, have had an impact on our society, both at home and abroad. And when my nephew asked me if I would do this, I said, well, all right, because there has been so many things that have been freely given to me as a way of living the life that Malcolm and those in the Nation of Islam, as well as those who have studied liberation theology under Dr. Cohn, um, who has written a book, a phenomenal book called Malcolm and Martin, looking at some parallelisms in our society. And so as a result of that, I'm hoping as a result of this discussion, can talk about some of the things that have impacted me, that may have impacted those like Malcolm and those like many of us who have come up through a time of Jim Crow, pro-Jim Crow, or pre-Jim Crow, as well as post-Jim Crow. So hopefully I can add something and we can take away something, all of us, as a result of this meeting. Bless you, thank you. Okay, well what I'll do is I'll get this party started and sharing my perspective and my thoughts about uh, Brother Malcolm X. Um, I was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, my parents, this might sound a little wild, but my parents didn't influence me in any way. And what I mean by that is they didn't push their fears on me, nor did they push their philosophies on me or any of that stuff. They kind of just let me work it out. 
And I can't say that they advised me in, in any way in particular. The first advice my mother gave me was probably about in 2001. First time she gave me advice. She called me up in the middle of the night and she said, it's like three o'clock in the morning, and she said, you know, how you talk in this society could potentially get you threatened and hurt. And how you feel, and I just want you to be aware of that. And I said, okay. And it was the first and only advice she ever gave me. She never directed me in any way as it relates to any belief system, religion, or otherwise. And that, the next day when I woke up, I realized that there's no way that I could exist with any kind of peace or freedom if I'm afraid of sharing how I feel. I just, I just can't do that. So from that day on, probably in 2001, I let it loose. And she caught me at a time when I was Dr. Khalid Abdul mad about everything. <laughs> and Malcolm was my man. And, um, you know, so uh, I just let it fly. And so in growing and evolving and, and observing and checking things out, I thought about, I always thought about Malcolm. And personally, one of the things that I learned from reading about Malcolm and listening to people talk about Malcolm and listening to his speeches and um, observing the experience that they went, that he went through when he was transitioning from the Nation of Islam. When I watched the videos and watched his lectures, one of the things that I learned most was how hurt he was at finding out that his leader was a human being. Now this is just my perspective. This is not necessarily the truth or necessarily right just my perspective. And he was so pained about his discovery, about what he felt was young women being impregnated by his leader, that he began to lash out emotionally, even to the extent of running to what was identified as the enemy to tell them about this. And what I learned from checking out that whole experience, and I hold on to it to this day. No man gets held higher than me for no reason whatsoever, on any level. I don't hold any man higher than me. This is not an arrogant boast as much as it is an understanding that we're all human beings who have our challenges in life. And so when we hold other human beings up, and they fall short, we don't learn from them. We make excuses for how and why they fell short. And so we, we, we remove our ability to truly learn from them. So the greatest lesson I received from Malcolm X is to never ever hold another man higher than you hold yourself. That way, when they fall short and they may make mistakes or whatever the case, you just remind yourself, well, you know, he, he's, he's just another man, and we all working this thing out. We all trying to figure it out. As far as his impact on um, our society and our community in general, in the United States in particular, when I look at Malcolm X's influence, the greatest thing that I've seen as far as his contribution to our society is the removal of fear from another group of people. 
And I think he had a major impact in, in encouraging us to not live in fear of people. Um, and his approach to doing that was his approach at that time. But on, as it relates to his influence on, on our community, as far as I've seen, it was, it was kind of like the beginning of, of, of dismantling the whole fear thing. And on an international level, on a, what I call a universal level, when I think about Malcolm X's impact, and, and one of the, 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 the greatest things I've learned from observing his experiences and listening to his lectures and stuff is that this man he didn't he wasn't afraid to make the, he wasn't afraid to change when he learned something that made more sense today than what made sense yesterday he said okay well hey I, I, I gotta roll with this he didn't seem to be invested in any particular philosophy. Now, when he embraced it, he embraced it with every fiber of his being. But when he learned something that he thought made a little bit more sense, then he didn't have any problem trying to continue to grow. A lot of people interpreted that as him being confused and not knowing what he wanted. When I look at it on a universal place, I looked at it from the standpoint of this is how human beings are supposed to operate. You can't keep investing in something that no longer makes sense to you if you learn more and learn new information. I mean, when I was growing up, they told us Pluto was a planet. And if you said Pluto wasn't a planet, you'd get that wrong on the test. And that was allegedly scientific. So, you know, I learned from him, you can't be so invested in a thought process or a philosophy, you present yourself from learning and getting to next levels of understanding. So that's my thought. I'm gonna pass this on. You know, I, I agree with what you're saying with, um, with in terms to Malcolm. I think internationally, and even if we even look, you know, in our own communities, how much is being taught about Malcolm? I think sometimes, um, we, and I'm not just talking about us, I'm talking about young people, they see him in one stance, right? They, they, it almost like the growth stops, um, whether or not they continue to learn, you know, throughout of what, um, what he was really representing. I know um, a lot of times students are taught about um, when Malcolm was in prison and learn and how to read, right? And reading the dictionary and the importance of that. Um, and you know, you, you'd hope that they would understand that that knowledge is key, and that's really what, um, in his autobiography, that is what it's speaking of. It's just how the, the ability to learn new things, kind of like what you were saying, allows you to grow, allows you to change. And there's nothing wrong with finding out something new and then adapting your your will and your understanding to that. And I'd like to think that that's what our young people are learning. Um, when, in terms to, of Malcolm X. Um, internationally, you know, it, I think it really depends on the representation of him, right? He's not here to speak for himself. Um, everyone is just speaking for him and what their ideas are about him. And you go back and you, and depends on, because he didn't really age, right? It depends on what, you know, videos you watch and you see of his actual words and his lectures. You can't tell the difference between, you know, 1964 and when he was speaking in, you know, early 1960s and 1959, you know what I mean? So if you watch something in his early, you will hear him say the chickens have come home to roost. You'll hear him say things about the white man. And, but then if you look a little further, he does change some of his ideas. He sees us all as human beings. So depending upon, and it's not to say that those weren't all truths. They were all his truths. But of course, in his evolution, we're able to see that truth changes, you know? And I, I think that's a huge um, understanding, right. is that how, how truth can change. And, and it really depends on where you are in time, um, which is you know, one thing that we can learn so much from his greatness.
Thank you. Thank you both. Um, for myself, a little bit different. Um, and, and, and I believe I say a little bit different than my nephew because I come up through a, a bit of a different period um, prior to my nephew. Being a product of a project a little north of here called Bellevue Square, I was born and raised in that project. And this was in the 50s and early 60s. And I can't remember the date. I don't recall the exact year. I believe it was 64, 65. Malcolm came here to Hartford, to Temple Number 14. I was around, I would say, 12, 13 years old. And at the time, his autobiography hadn't been written yet. But I could relate to all, many of the things that was going on for Malcolm. And I talk about that relation because sister talked about hindsight. Sometimes when we're being tested or tried or challenged, we don't know what that test is until another time. And as a youth coming up in that project, there was something that was within many of us that wanted to help our community, to help our people. And we established what we call clubs, social clubs. Other people called them gangs. A gang that I became a part of was called the Magnificent Twenties. And then we changed because we were younger and we didn't want to be a part of the older Magnificent Twenties. We changed our name to the Emperors. Another club that evolved into what was considered by the city as a gang. At the age of 14, I wanted to gravitate to something else which was called the Black Panther Party because once again, wanting to do something such as Malcolm because that environment at that time said something needed to be done to elevate change. And Malcolm changed within himself from his afflictions. Addiction, prison, some of the experience many people that we may know, if not ourselves, have experienced. I myself have had a 56 year experience with addiction, the first 25 as a heroin addict right here in this city and the epidemic was so great back then, no one talked about it. It was like it disappeared. And today we hear epidemic with this opiate epidemic and everybody up in arms like it's something new. Well, like Malcolm said, there's nothing new under the sun. And the reality is, is one of the things that Malcolm strictly believed in, a teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And as my nephew said about believing or following men, the Creator has given us a mind so we can have a relationship with that source on our own. Whatever faith tradition, whatever organization you choose to participate in, get involved in, do as such because there's growth. And for Malcolm, something that I read in my nephew's book that applies to Malcolm. Malcolm did not just age, Malcolm grew. There's a difference between aging and growing. And Malcolm grew. Every experience that he had, he learned from and built on. So the thing is, is that what I'm hearing even from my nephew, because he started out his conversation talking about a conversation that he had with his mother. We don't get to elevate ourselves to be the stars that we may become on our own. There's a million ways to become a star or to be a star. And there's so many ways to add to the growth and development of humanity. Malcolm was a key and instrumental figure in that. The thing that I struggle with to this very day is oftentimes we put our leaders on our walls. We hold them up as martyrs, but the work that they did, we seem to set aside. 
I believe it's time for many communities and faith traditions to begin to talk or walk, or walk or talk rather than talking or walk. We hear a lot of what people are saying. Light travels faster than sound. People see what you do before they hear what you say now. And that's why I believe our movements today are different than they were in the 60s when Malcolm was around. We had Malcolm, we had Martin, we had H. Rap Brown, we had Huey P. Newton, we had Stokely Carmichael, Jesse Jackson, the list goes on and on. But today we have movements like the Me Too movement, the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement, and we don't know where the leader is. Because there's something that's going on today that's grounded in the birth of what Malcolm began with. And that is the knowledge of self understanding self and there's so many organizations institutions that's inspiring our youth to know who they are to value themselves rather than valuing things when we realize the power of self Malcolm began to recognize that in the incubator of a prison stone walls do not a prison make prison is of the mind and he was able to release his mind we had another individual such as Malcolm who was in a dungeon in prison, but he rose above that to become the president of the same nation that oppressed him. And so the thing is, is that Malcolm, he pricked the minds of those through his education, through his learning, through his teaching, that no matter how far, how far you fall, how low you go, you can rise above it. We fall down but we get up. Our getting up hasn't ended. It's just beginning. So therefore, that's the thing that Malcolm, to me, has inspired, the educational development of the mind. Thank you. Cool. So what I want to do right now is basically just have a conversation. I like to know what other what your thoughts are about Malcolm, how you feel, maybe if you have any comments or any questions you want to put on the table. But uh, I'm interested in your input. Can we you wanna use that mic? Good afternoon everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, based on your comments particularly, but all three together. When you talk about the movement for your generation and the movement now, and when you listen to people like uh, Dr. Boyce Waters and Tourette's yes. talk about getting on code, can you talk about what you feel getting on code is today's relevancy versus back in your era? Is it, is it more impactful or was it more impactful back then than it is now? Talk about the movement. Thank you, brother. The way I see movies today, in comparison to the time of the 60s, the 50s, 60s, 70s, is that you, you had a leader in the forefront. And I'm quite sure many of you here may have read or heard about the, the counterintelligence movement um, by the FBI. When I, did, when I wrote my first thesis, my, master, my master's thesis, the title was, the black man, an endangered species. And I used concepts from scripture as well as research to show how leaders were being assassinated, annihilated. People were infiltrating their movements and so before they could get started good, they were destroyed. But today, the, the movement seems to be different. There is no one you can latch on to. You may kill a person, but you will never kill an idea. And the idea of the youth today is powerful. It's almost like the book of Joshua. And I don't want to get script, although I'm an ordained minister, and I've, been, I've studied uh, religion um, intently, uh, have a degree in theology. The point is, is that Joshua didn't cross over with Moses. Moses didn't go because Moses had got tired. And sometimes when we age, we get tired. 
And I don't know what Malcolm would have been if he would have lived to be 50, 60, 70 years old. But what I do know is from looking at history and Frederick Douglass and, and all those, Booker T. Washington and all those other leaders of our past, when they knew who they were, they could begin to infiltrate them and annihilate them. Today, these young people, they got it together and they know the code, they know the language, and they speak in a language that's almost like a foreign language to us, but they know what time it is, and they know how to communicate with each other, and there's not one person that you can pinpoint or point to that you can attack. So for me, from my perspective, we didn't have Google. We ain't have Facebook. FaceTime, your time, my time. I mean, we had to figure it out. Y'all have a so much information now, it's now using that information. That's the key. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Brad. Do I have a follow-up question? Yes, sir. Based on what you just said. So, uh, COINTELPRO is a lab as well. Yes. It just evolved, right? So, when you talked about information in the groups of young folks being a code, with the predominant violence against uh, our culture, yes. like women and kids being soft targets yes. for white supremacy. You're talking about today's group so powerful. Back in the 60s, that really wasn't go going down too much because there was a warrior class identified back then, right? Yes, sir. It's not really a warrior class identified today, I would say. That's my personal opinion. Get your insights on that because I think that Coatel Pro um, 2000 and beyond is, is live and kicking. Uh, go ahead, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll no, respond no, no. afterwards. Um, once again, you talked about Dr. Joyce. Um, not too long ago, he made a post and he said, LeBron James, be careful. LeBron James, be careful. Well, why? Well, today is not like, once again, in the 50s and 60s when you had Jim Brown, you had Bill Russell, and they would come together and unify for social advocacy. We have not just gotten involved in social justice. We've been involved in this from day one. But now what's beginning to happen is our resources are beginning to come together. We have athletes, we have the medical field, we have those who are part of the nine academic systems of functioning, coming together, not divided anymore. That old concept of divide and conquer, uh, that day is over. Too much information, too many youth beginning to come together, not using the same old systematic ways that we once gravitated to. That has changed. They're becoming producers directors, they're beginning to tell our story ourselves. That's a whole nother different ball game than what Paul Robeson had to go through, what those in the past had to go through. But they had to go through that so we can be where we are today. Thank you. No comment? Not yet. <laughs> My, my vision a little different from my uncle's. <laughs> Absolutely. And the common denominator between the youth of today and say my, my uncle's generation is that they are still buying into racism and white supremacy and the race-based paradigm. We buy into it today, we bought into it then. It is my perspective that identifying the behavior of those who have challenges with black folks as racism or white supremacy is like identifying a bird that flies as a, 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 a birdist or a wingist or a, a bird supremacist. 
when you are looking at the um, the nature of the behavior of something and you put a label on it, I could never get you to come to a meeting to fix uh, birdism or bird supremacy. Identify it as birds flying. Because you're going to say, it doesn't matter what we do, birds are going to keep flying. No matter what I label it, I can't get you to a meeting to fix it or change it or adjust it. I can't. And so, when I hear us getting ourselves caught up in what is called racism or white supremacy, what I'm seeing is the nature of the behavior of a certain group of people who have some challenges with who we are. The nature of a behavior. When I call it the nature of a behavior, I'm not looking at now, I'm looking at historical, I'm looking at the history, reading the books. There is no period in history that I've checked that people who have problems with people or uh, 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 a segment of the white population who have problems with so-called black folks, I, I don't see any history where that segment of the population has not been destructive towards not just their own people, not just black people, but towards natural resources, destroying land, destroying animals, even to the extent there's a group of human beings that are extinct because of the same group of people who want to empower, power, have power over everything and everybody. So for me, this is not a condemnation of all white people. This is a, an understanding of the nature of the behavior of that segment of the white population who can't live with other people without needing to control everything, needing to control the weather, needing to control the damn seeds and fruit, needing to control everything. Historically, no matter how far back I go, I cannot find where the behavior was any different. This is not just a black people thing. Towards their own people before they even met us. Same thing. In America, when they wanted to destroy all the indigenous people here, they damn near made the buffalo extinct. Running around haphazardly killing all of the buffalo in an attempt to freeze and starve all the indigenous people to death. This is a consciousness and mindset that has a deep, and long historical consistency. So today, for me to see the people who function in this manner as supremacist or racist, for me, it's being in denial about the nature of the behavior. Because if I look at it from the standpoint of the nature of the behavior, now I can say, Birds fly, frogs jump, this is what they do. This is the reality of what they do. If I'm angry and I'm upset about it and I am having meetings about fixing it, I call all that denial. It is our responsibility to see it for what it is and then have a plan on dealing with the nature of it. It's like being in the forest and you have your little baby and your baby sees a baby tiger and they start playing. The baby doesn't know the nature of the behavior of tigers. The baby doesn't know that that mother is nearby just like the baby's mother is nearby. So when the mother tiger comes and rips the baby to shreds, you have to learn the reality of the behavior of tigers. You can't think that a, a law or an amendment or an act is going to change the nature of the behavior of tigers. So for me, what I see that's consistent from even before my uncle's time up until this day, we continue to remain in denial about the nature of the behavior of a group of people 
who have not demonstrated that they have the ability to change. And as long as we keep getting mad and trying to have racism and white supremacy meetings and identifying the behavior as racism and white supremacy, nothing's going to change for us. Life is way bigger than struggling and fighting and trying to overcome. Life is huge, man. And this race-based paradigm, we are a universal people. We are a universal people. And when we withdraw ourselves to this speck of dust from a grain of sand called the race-based paradigm, we withdraw from the universe and embrace this paradigm on this speck of dust. And as long as we are on it, we are owned. I don't care about what people think slavery is or what it might be. When you embrace a philosophy created by some other person and in, the, in that embracing that philosophy you are controlled, you're owned. You're still enslaved. You might not be in shackles and getting beat down, but you're still enslaved. And what I see today that is consistent is the consciousness and mindset of our people is the same. And I'm going to say this last thing. One of the reasons why it's the same is because the group of people had a 400-year period of crafting our consciousness. So we have yet to deal with the fact that we're functioning with a consciousness created by somebody else. And then we look around and ask, why we behave like this? Well, look at the behavior of the people that had control over our consciousness for 400 years. So, that's where I'm at. Um, I, especially talking about the youth, um, being a, a teacher, I work with um, high schoolers, and the one thing I have to say about the different movements that come and go um, is that they come and go. Um, the, the ability for a lot of young people to, you know, kind of stick and stay with something, because it, every, all the, there's so much information. It's moving so quickly um, that, you know, one day they're, they're kind of latched on to one thing, and then the next day they somewhat have forgotten about it. There still is this consciousness that our young people still follow behind um, with materialism, you know, um, racism, you know, not thinking that they're beautiful, but like they're still battling a lot of that. You know, the ideas that have been handed to them by the oppressors, you know, still are in their, you know, in their everyday life. You know, not being happy with what they see in the mirror. And that, that really is a, a huge thing that Malcolm was trying to dismantle for the longest time when he talks about who taught us to hate ourselves. That, that hate is still here. You know, to the point where now it's, it's acceptable to be like, that's my nigga. You my nigga. And it comes out, it, it, you'll talk to adults and be like, well, we own that word now. No, we're now we're talking about owning things. You know? Are we owning our consciousness of it? Of changing? I mean, if, if we really think about where our young people are today, they are in a place where that is normal. Not having your real eyes is normal. Not having your real hair is normal. You know, we're really, you know, I would love to say that, you know, the, the, the movements are moving, you know, whether it's the Me Too movement or the Black Lives Matter movement are happening and there's no necessary face to it, but our young people need leaders. They really do. Um, because if they're, if they're latching onto whatever new hashtag, they're, they're not, they're, it'll be gone in the wind. You know, and a lot of young people need someone to help them understand the history of things. Because they're not, they're not understanding the history. You know, a lot of people, you, you talk to young people and you say Malcolm X, they're like, who? I might have read a story by him, is he an author? Like, you know, who's educating them? You know, and I, I, I'm one teacher, but I'm one. You know, I, I would hope that they're, you know, getting it at home, um, but that's not always the truth that the young people are getting it at home, especially if we know that parents are working two, three jobs. They're still wrapped up in their own consciousness of hatred 
for themselves, hatred for their children, hatred for their partners, right? So, you know, I'd love to really say that Malcolm X's, you know, um, ideas are still living strong. I think in older people, it, they are. But the young people need to be reintroduced to all of the levels of who Malcolm was and those ideas of how do we say that a movement um, is empowered by, by the youth. Um, because at this point, you know, the, the hashtags change. You're right, it's not a slogan. It's a slogan, right? And I, every time I, I see, no, I, got it. I, got it. I, I every time I see, you know, Black Lives Matter, I think, are we talking about how much they matter? Because just seeing Black Lives Matter doesn't say how much they matter. You know, we you, you hear that, and it just becomes another another soundbite when we need to go far beyond, you know, um, what's you know what catches on on a hashtag. Thank you, sister. Thank you, my nephew. Um, I, uh, I, I love to come to my nephew's shop and have him do my hair because we get into these conversations. Um, when he talked about if birds had clipped wings, well, if we in our society saw many birds like we see whales and other things being damaged, it behooves someone with some compassion to attempt to help those birds. Um, I, 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 I say that because when we talk about people not coming together, not agreeing, well, there was a people in scripture, the people of Nineveh, those in the time of Jonah. They came together and that's why Jonah was mad because Jonah wanted them to be punished for what they did and he felt that they deserved to get what they had done and so therefore Jonah didn't want them to have peace, but ultimately they got peace. Now, I say that not to say that Nineveh was an example and that there were no problems after that, because there were, because we can recognize those problems today. But I prefer to be more solution focused than problem focused. As my nephew also talked about nature, there's a book called Lifespan Development. I would ask anyone to read it. The reason why I ask that we read, if you read it, is because it talks about human development, human behavior, tribalism, and things of that nature. And when he talked about race, he's absolutely right. But A.J. Rogers talked about that some time ago when he wrote a book called Nature Knows No Color Lines. The reality is, is there's a, when I was talking about my youth in Malcolm, there was, it was based on experience. When I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I related a lot to Malcolm. His father being murdered, my father being murdered when I was six years old. Him having an addiction, I had that addiction. Didn't think I could overcome it. Didn't think I could, I could rise above that. Raising children, raising a family, and strung out on heroin, how can you live? But I also learned from Malcolm because I went to where Malcolm went to find, I was trying to find a solution to my problem. My nephew talks about following, leading self. That's phenomenal. But we don't live in a vacuum. We live with others. And the environment teaches us something. And it behooves us to learn so we can give back. We are not just of self. I am an extension of my son, my oldest, and he's an extension of me. And so therefore, what I leave for him, hopefully, will be greater than what I have. And so when we say what our youth are doing, our youth are doing some phenomenal stuff. But you can't look at MSNBC, CNN, and all those social or other media markets that tell us about the negativity that's going on. If there was no positivity going on, we would not be here right now. He would not be doing what he's doing now if he hadn't been on the shoulders of someone else, pricking his brain, pricking the conscience of his mind. As an educator, I've been a teacher at a college, at a university, as well as in a high school. Got it, I understand the nature of learning. And so when we talk about learning, learning is not done in a vacuum either. That's the difference between that time and this time you have access to information. We didn't have access. 
Everything was hidden. They told us to believe. Malcolm said, his words, not mine. Belief won't set you free. Faith won't set you free. Truth will set you free or make you free. Now that we have truth in the forefront, we can begin to change. And we begin to see the movement changing. And that's why we can't grab a hold of it. Don't know who it is. That's the way it was designed. Not by me, but the greatest designer that I know. And believe me, it ain't Versace or even St. Laurent. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody have any more thoughts or questions or input? form is, thank you so much. It's just that coming from that period and people beginning to put, it's, it's amazing how people put words on Jesus' lips. They said Jesus said this, when if they studied Jesus ain't saying none of that. And they put words on Malcolm's lips. They said, Malcolm said this. No, Malcolm didn't say that. The thing about Malcolm is that even after Malcolm found out about the women, Malcolm would have stayed in the nation of Islam. Malcolm wasn't about to leave the nation of Islam because he found out about that. Because scripturally, we know prophets in the past that had more than one wife. And so that wasn't an issue. The issue was what was going on between those who are following Malcolm and those who were believed to be following the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. There was a split and there was a, def a definitive counterintelligence movement infiltrated by those, the person who gave Malcolm X Malcolm off resuscitation at the time of his murder was in the FBI. The reality is, is that there's a lot of things that goes on behind the scenes that we don't know. And so therefore, looking back as a therapist, I have a drug treatment program in South Florida, have a private practice here in Connecticut um, that deals with addictive disorders and mental health. I say that because when we latch on to a condition, as my nephew mentioned. When we latch on to a, a condition, oftentimes what we attempt to do is treat the symptom rather than treat what the issue is. We no longer have to treat symptoms because we know the problem. And that's why I believe our youth are so dynamic. They're establishing businesses. They're becoming entrepreneurs themselves. They're beginning to come together where we once were divided that they are now becoming unified. That's the foundation. We have to deal in unity. This has been a time, this period of 
whatever they want to call it, Trumpism, I think this is the greatest time of, in history. Because it gives us an opportunity to come together as one and do the things that we were designed to do as a people. I heard someone talk about being imperfect. I am perfectly imperfect. I was designed to be imperfect. I was designed to make mistakes. If I didn't make mistakes, I wouldn't learn. So the reality is, is understanding learning, understanding development. What parent knows and has time to do that in this time of crisis? They don't have time to study books and, and psychology and sociology. So they send their children off to an institution, hopefully believing that their children are going to receive that, the knowledge of self. But they don't. They learn about science, math, history, language, nothing about self. So they value things other than self. And when Malcolm learned about himself and he began to love himself and respect himself, you saw a change in him. The change won't be external. It has to be internal. Change is an inside job, not an outside job. Thank you, nephew. Were there any other questions? It was um, quite a lot of information out there, a lot of thoughts out there and comments, but I can say myself as far as my parents are concerned. Um, before I start to become more of a Put the mic up. For, so for that um, I like the fact that now I can see it. He wasn't afraid to, change, to challenge the racial equality that we Amen. have going on in the world today. He wasn't afraid to put people on blast and let them know exactly where they're at and how they see things. Um, I look at the generation from where I'm at now for myself, and I know you commented on the young people doing a lot of things now and so forth, but a lot of the young people that I see now are so misguided, so institutionalized in the mind by what they're learning in school, they're not really learning anything. If you've got people that haven't treated you right, they're not gonna treat you right either. They're not going to train you right. So a lot of the people, especially our people, that are going to school, they're learning, they're not really learning anything about them. For as long as I can remember, like what you said, brother, that um, the mindset of white supremacy has been changed. It's always been about control, domination, and so forth. Even as far as I can remember being younger in school and learning, we were always taught that we were you listen to a lot of white people speak, they say, all right, this is what our people did. We were this type of inventor, we did this, we created this, and so forth. When it came to African Americans and black people, we were always slaves. So as a, as a result, you start to see that white people were more dominant over black people when there was that type of mindset, I'm more superior than you. In the actual, in the actual reality, we had a lot more, we had a lot of rich history, deep history, but that stuff doesn't get talked about. A lot of that stuff gets suppressed. So what I like about Ox is that you know, he wasn't afraid to get the challenge with those situations. And as we get older, we have to learn, we have to change the mindset here in order to be better to start to raise up to unify. A lot of the people don't know how to unify. We're all scattered, diverse in different places, and we don't want to come together. And that's another big problem. That's why I also, we have any shoe country, we don't we don't we don't have any economical backing behind anything. A lot of times I don't I don't want to be rude, but we just got a few more minutes. So if you can make a point, and I know the brother wanted to say something, and then the sister wanted to say something. So I'm just saying that pretty you know, those are the things that I learned and it would be good that the people just start coming together and start raising awareness for our people, so the young people start doing what we gotta do. Thank you. Do you feel our young people today with the resources that we have, we have the technology, we have more financial resources in terms of the entertainment industry, the sports industry? We see a lot of quotes from our young people about now. However, do you feel that we're lacking the same discipline? 
that Malcolm carried. Many want to fool him, but don't want to follow his disciplines. Mm. And it's why we don't mm. get to a certain areas that we should. And I think outside of the religion of Islam, not only was the discipline there, but in terms of his time, his travel, he knew what he wanted to do. And I think, and I want your perspective on this, what do we have to do today to get our young people to understand the importance of discipline and order in our lives uh, in order to achieve what us as a people uh, are capable of doing? All right, what we're going to do is we, we come into the end, so we're going to each answer that question, and then we're going to have to shut it down. So appreciate that question. Go ahead, sister. You first. Um, what, especially working with young people with discipline, I think um, we do have to start at home. So it can't just be that parents are sending their children off to school and thinking that's where they're going to all get it. So it has to be beyond teaching young people as it is about teaching their parents and teaching the older generations that we have to put the phones down, right? We have, it, I mean, there is time. There is time for, for parents to learn more, to be able to teach, but they have to want that. Um, especially being the only sister on the, the panel and, and really in this room I see sisters up, up there. I think one thing that Malcolm also really spoke to was to protect our women. And I, I think he would have still left because of the way that women were being abused in the nation. And he even spoke about the fact that women needed to be protected. And that it was the, it was the fact, and that's one discipline right there that, that a lot of our people are missing. To protect women, to protect our children. Um, and the protection starts by protecting their minds to a lot of the things that we are, are feeding them, that we are uh, feeding them, you know, with food, feeding them with, with knowledge, or lack of feeding them knowledge. So I think it really has to start there. I mean, our youth isn't going to change until, really, us as adults start to change and see that they're not going to get it from the television, from their cell phones, from the teachers in the classroom, that it has to start homegrown at home. Thank you, sister. Two things from Malcolm teaching. We talk about Malcolm, but let's talk about Malcolm teaching. A man can teach an individual, but a woman will teach a whole nation. That's what, that's the type of respect they have for women and still to this very day. Because if you don't respect a woman, then your nation is done. Second, I just want to say, and what the brother was talking about, and, and what do we do? We're doing a multitude of things, but the, the difficulty, what I see is, things are oftentimes splintered. We don't know what's being done. We don't know what we don't know. And so therefore, it's important to access the proper information that we can begin to utilize so we can begin to do more of a coming together. Because there's a multitude of things that's being done. I would suggest, first thing, I you just saw me sweating a minute ago, and I'm gonna just say this and then I'm gonna pass the mic on. I just went through a bout of cancer. Brothers, men, if you're in the building, wherever, have yourself checked. We have to make sure that we as black men, that we make sure that we check ourselves because we need to be healthy. If we're not healthy, we won't be here to help our children, our wives, our mothers, our daughters to do what needs to be done. So please get yourself checked. Lastly, I believe that we need to teach entrepreneurship we need to teach ownership. Rather than teaching about something that's fake and not true, we need to deal in truth. Begin to help our children, give them or teach them about the nature of capitalism. If you're in a capitalistic society, know where you at. And so therefore, begin to build, build in your homes, teach them how to own, not to be consumers, but producers. And Malcolm was a firm believer in producers. They had their own farms, they had their own bakeries, but something happened. So when we begin to be owners and producers rather than consumers, whether it's our story in the media or anywhere else, it's time for us and our youth are moving in that direction. You can see it. They're beginning to say, I don't want to just be a part of the entertainment industry. I want to own it. 
and that's a new day. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you, nephew. All right, um, I want to say this um, to answer the question: How do how do we get the youth to be more disciplined? Right? Yes. And so. For me, I don't think discipline is the issue because they are extremely disciplined. They're extremely disciplined when it comes to maintaining their Instagram, <laughs> their Facebook. They're extremely disciplined when it comes to how they present themselves when they go out every day. They're extremely disciplined when it comes to keeping up with the things that are important to them. They have discipline, but the challenge is not discipline. Even the, the person who smokes crack has discipline because they get up every day to get that rock. And they don't even know that they're spending four or $500 a week more than a lot of some people making to just live in their house. But they have the discipline to do what it takes to get the money to get the crack. So my point, what, which is what I'm always pointing at, is the consciousness. The mindset. Somebody was complaining about uh, these people leaving guns in our neighborhood. Well, I don't care about who's leaving guns in the neighborhood. I care about those who choose to pick them up and use them on each other, because that starts with the consciousness. It starts with the mindset. So one of the challenges we have is like that bear on a bicycle in the circus. Some of y'all familiar with that bear on a bicycle in the circus? By the time that bear is riding that bicycle in a circle, the bear is out of its natural mind. The way we know the bear is out of its natural mind, because the bear would never pick that bike up and learn how to ride it in the forest. So we now know that the bear is functioning with a consciousness created by the trainer. So the bear says, you know what, I want freedom. And I'm going to demand freedom. And the lions and tigers and bears and everybody said, well, we down with you. We going, we going to demand freedom. So they go to the trainer and said, listen, we want freedom. And the trainer said, okay, well, what do you want? The bear says, we want to be able to dress like you. We want to be able to eat what you eat. We want to be able to live with you where you live. We want to be able to have the things you have. Well, in the bear's demand for freedom, the bear is demonstrating it is still out of its natural mind. So the challenge for us is that we have to address the fact that we are functioning with a consciousness somebody else created, which is what I said earlier. We have, I personally, and all I've read, the videos I've watched, the books I've read, I have yet to hear any of the alleged leadership on any level speak about the fact that we are functioning with a consciousness that somebody created over a 300 to 400 year period. And until that is addressed, we're going to keep doing all these superficial things. We're going to have a midnight gym program. And we're going to have, we're going to make sure we got 13 year olds who are getting scholarships to 15 colleges. But guess what? They functioning with a consciousness somebody created, so that intelligence is going to be crafted into a tool used against them. It's the consciousness we have to deal with. That's what we have to address. Our mindset and our consciousness. I want to thank y'all for hanging out with us. This is the Malcolm X Forum. This is my Uncle Martin Jackson Sr. And this is... Tell him. <laughs> Sister Summerton. Thank you. You, you, you don't yeah, say yeah. it like Sister Summer Tate. And I'm so glad she came because I was working real hard to get a female involved in this and on this panel. Anybody that's working with us can tell you I, I needed a sister. And she came and I called on it. She came. So I thank y'all for being here. I thank y'all for participating, y'all. We out. Peace. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, nephew. I'm out. Hey, son. Thank you so much for Thank participating you. in our panel discussion. What we're going to do is roll right into our keynote address. We are honored to have Harvard's first poet.